church and Wally's church family. It's good to have you all here. I understand you came from all over, north, south, east, and west. We gather here this morning to, of course, honor God and to celebrate Wally's life and to appreciate what Wally has done in our lives in that he has influenced all of us in one way or the other. He's dug himself deep into Council Grove. I've only known Wally for three years. And the way I met him was I needed a plumber. <laughs> and it went from there. The writer Solomon said, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the words, there is a time for everything under the sun. In all our time, your time, my time, Wally's time, it's a time to be born, a time to die. And in between those two extremes, I would add a time to grow up, a time for school, a time for marriage, a time to raise a family, a time for close friends, which he had many, and a time to grow old and a time to die. As we reflect on Wally's life, let us trust in God's presence here with us now and his strength and God's loving embrace as we celebrate Wally's life and affirm our own hope in the resurrection of the dead because of Jesus Christ, what he's done for Wally and what he will do for all those who believe in him. Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious Lord and God, we approach your throne in prayer this morning, recognizing you are the Lord, the Lord of all that's living. We're reminded of the words of the psalmist who said, with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. And so we gather to affirm Wally's hope and our hope in the resurrection of the dead through Jesus. We know that we are safe in your embrace, Lord, in life and in death. We know you are ready to hear our prayers in times of grief when life seems empty because of the death of someone who has passed on into your eternal love. So often we find it difficult uh, to express the words that we feel in one way or the other. But we hear the words of the psalmist when we lift our eyes to the hills asking where our help comes. Our help comes not from the hills, but it comes from you. Open our eyes that we may save glimpses of your tr uh, trust and hope in the resurrection, that we see glimpses of your molding of Wally's life. We thank you for this time to celebrate and to see your hand work and what you have done in Wally for almost 90 years and most of it here in Council Grove, how he touched all who knew him, enjoyed the company, of many, and uh, we give you thanks. So we come to you believing and trusting that you will give us a glimpse of your grace as you have molded his life and strengthen our hope and trust in your promise through Jesus Christ, who guarantees that life has the final word. Help us to believe where he's not seen. Help us to trust even in the shadow of death, knowing that you are present with us, and so we pray for blessing and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a few scriptures that uh, Wally had written in his Bible. Well, he had many scriptures written in his Bible. But uh, some of the ones that we've talked about and were brought up, of course, the first one is Psalm 23. Hear the word of the Lord with the psalmist David. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green, quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the New Testament, beginning with John and John 14, one of Wally's very familiar scriptures. John 14 and verses 1 through 6. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, or how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of God from John. And then there's Paul's words where Wally mentioned uh, or had marked in his Bible uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and beginning with verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of the eye at the trump last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and he will be changed, we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? And finally, the last reading I have is in 2 Corinthians, beginning with chapter uh, 4 and through chapter 4, but starting with chapter 7, or verse 7, I'm sorry. In fact, I'll start in with verse 5 here to get the context. It says, For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves is your servants for Christ's sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, to give us the light and the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. That's what I've seen in Wally. Then he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. And then I'll skip down here. Therefore, verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart, Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is not seen, since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. This is the word of God, and it's so true of Wally. His vessel was breaking down as I knew him. But he always had the hope. Christ lived in him, and he lived for the eternal, which he knew when I last spoke to him was quite soon. Brothers and sisters, it's your turn to speak. You know more about Wally's life than I do, so please.
someone once said that during your lifetime, you were preparing for your funeral sermon just by how you live. And so right now, you and I, we're writing our funeral message. My dad, Wally, he's already written his. Uh, and because, um, because of how he lived and the words that he used, uh, this was a pretty easy task to preach his funeral. And um, because I know with, with not just his actions, but especially his words, and for, for my dad, those words had meaning. Every word that he used had meaning. He was, a man, he was not a man of a lot of words. But when he said something, you know you needed to listen because he meant it. Um, he, loved, he loved many things. Uh, and I know how to love um, you and me and, and being in relationships with uh, family and people. He learned that from God and he learned that from being raised by godly parents. Uh, but I think when it came down to the most important relationships, it was us in this room. He was the one that uh, he loved the most. Uh, and I knew that uh, because uh, he showed his love in a lot of different ways. He would serve us. Uh, he would go to your, your football games, your basketball games. Um, he, he would want to be a part of your life. He want to know how you're doing. Uh, he loved you that much. But for me, nothing spoke to me more than uh, how he loved you and me through his words. When it, was, uh, when it came to public speaking, he was not an eloquent man. In fact, I can remember being a kid and listening to his communion meditations on a Sunday morning at church, and he would chop his sentence. Sister Shirley would have a, would, would have a heyday parsing his sentences uh, because you couldn't. They were, they were all fragments. But uh, I can tell you one thing, and that was when it came to telling you and me that he loved us, he could not have come across more competent and more eloquent. Um, and, um, and really nothing came across more confident and eloquent than when I was able to spend about a week with him and my mom before my mom passed away. Uh, she was already fighting the cancer, and Wally was taking care of her. And so in the evening, he would, my mom, Norma, grandma, um, she would be sitting in that light blue recliner uh, right in front of the TV set, and Wally would pull a dining room chair up next to her, and he'd sit down, and they would watch Little House on the Prairie and Will of Fortune every night. And when, when that was done, he would get up out of his chair and he'd put it back at the, at the dining room table. He'd go in front of Norma and he said, Norma, it's time for bed. And he'd help her up and they'd go to the bedroom and he'd get her dressed and, and get her ready for bed. He'd take her back out and before, before he sat her down in the recliner, and this happened every night, he would grab her by the shoulders and he would prop her up and he would say, Norma, look at me. I need you to look at me. And at that point, as you know, her face was already, it was hard for her to look up. And he said, I want you, I want to see your face. And he said, Norma, I want you to know you're a wonderful wife. You've been a wonderful mom for our kids. And I love you. Every night he would say those words to her, and then he would set her down and help her lie back in the recliner to go to sleep. And nothing spoke to me more than that, of how important it is that we share our words with one another, not just, and, and he was really good about saying, I love you at the end of the phone call. You know, it's, and, and he didn't say it once, he said, I love you, okay, bye, I love you, bye, okay, bye. Um, you know, he was, he was good at that. But when it came to telling you what he really wanted to communicate, he was so eloquent. And with my mom, he was so eloquent. It's like, where did those words come from? Because I wanted to remember those. I wanted to write them down if I could. Because he shared with words how much he loved her. 
and I know he did that with you. I know he did that with several of you, gave, gave you a blessing. And so I think if Wally were here right now, he would tell you, he, he would, well, first of all, he would be embarrassed and he would be humbled. <laughs> uh, and he wouldn't have the words to say. But I think if, if he were able to be back here right now, you know, I think he would say, hey, listen, first of all, I want you to know this heaven thing, it's for real. You need to make sure you're ready. But secondly, use your words wisely and use them while you have time. Tell your family you love them and tell them what you appreciate about them, not just I love you, but like he did. You're a wonderful wife. You've been a wonderful mom to our kids. So that's my story. For him, he was not an eloquent man as far as speeches were concerned, but when it came to communicating love with words, he was the man. And so... Now, I want to give uh, you all an opportunity, if you would like to share a memory you have, to put into words your thoughts and your memories about Wally. And if, if you do, let me encourage you to come up front and just stand right here behind the uh, podium. And I, I'm, I'm going to say take as much time as you need. And, of course, I just created panic in... in um, those that are responsible for getting us to the graveside. But, uh, but let me encourage you to come. If you have something prepared, come up right now. And you know if you don't, I'll have to share another Wally story. This is kind of a funny one. Not sure I'm proud of it, but um, early on when Mark and I got married, um, well, let me back up. First of all, Wally liked food, <laughs> didn't he? Um, one memory I have from our rehearsal dinner was when we looked over and um, it, was, it was Lori noticed how full Wally's plate was. And... Um, a comment was made to Wally, and Wally said, well, I'm paying for this. <laughs> His plate was mounded from the buffet. So um, anyway, also then early on in our marriage, um, they had come to visit, and um, Wally loved my mashed potatoes and gravy. And Norma got frustrated <laughs> with that because... He liked mine better than hers. And I didn't want to cause any family conflict, but I'm embarrassed to tell you that Wally liked boxed mashed potatoes <laughs> and canned gravy better than Norma's. So I'm embarrassed to say that, but early on that was my style. But um, they just loved being around that family table and eating with all of you. I remember so many family dinners. So um, that, that's my story. Just their relationship was, was wonderful, and even if it was mostly over food. All right, I'm going to say one, and I'll have my brother Randy come on up. Um, and uh, that is my dad. Um, not only did he, since the uh, food story's already been shared, I won't share another one. But um, my dad was always, he, he was a good father. Uh, he wanted to make sure the kids were prepared for life. And I can remember wanting to buy my first car. And I was so excited. It was this fluorescent orange uh, I think it was a 76 Chevy Nova, bright orange with a vinyl tan roof, sunroof too, and um, it, was, it, was, it was awesome. And so I was ready to convince my dad that I was going to buy that. And so at night he got home and we sat down in the kitchen nook and he started to write down, okay, on a piece of paper he wanted to show me. All right, so this is your car payment. Here, here are your tags and taxes. Here's your insurance. Okay, now how are we paying for this much? And how much are you making right now? 
And it's like, uh, I, c I can do this. Well, anyhow, long story short, I left frustrated and, r and really mad, but my dad saved me from a lot of hurt and uh, a lot of headaches. And so he, he did, he taught me and prepared me for uh, adulthood. So sometimes I'm sure it felt like he was raising a child, but in reality he was raising an adult. And so I love him for that. Yeah, one of the things that I remember about Dad <coughs> involves Mark. When Mark was in elementary school, the teacher had them do an assignment. What does your dad, what do you and your dad do for fun? And Mark's paper was, my dad and I go on service calls together <laughs> for fun. And that was true. I remember many a nights where after dinner I would go with dad uh, to help clean up a project that had been done earlier that day. Those were good times because it was with our dad. We live in a world that could best be described as a sea of humanity. People everywhere. And now, one looks alike. The masks that cover our faces right now make it so much more difficult to, to differentiate between people. It is kind of like a Where's Waldo picture, a sea of color, a sea of people, and we look for Waldo. Where is that person with the red, red and white striped shirt and with the red and white striped stocking cap? This raises a question of how can an individual be picked out of a crowd? What makes a person unique? What makes a person not ordinary? And so I'll share this. A few years ago, I preached a sermon, developed a sermon about titled No Ordinary Man. And in that sermon, I used the following illustration about our dad. Here's what I said. Council Grove, Kansas is a community with a population of 2,000. Everybody knows my dad, Wally Ingmeyer. He's an 85-year-old man who still runs his business every day. He's been running the business since its startup in 1969. I was in junior high at the time. He had an opportunity to take a new job in the big city a big city of 20,000, Junction City, Kansas. All I remember is I didn't want to move. And I'm not sure anyone else in the family wanted to move. And so he started his own business. The business does plumbing, heating, electrical, refrigeration work. They also sell appliances. He is known for the way he treats people, patient, honest, and has never charged his customers what they should really pay. Still at 85, he's up in the morning and down in his shop by a little after 8 o'clock. He unlocks the building, turns on the lights, and checks the service calls that he and his now one employee have for that day. About 8.30, he's out the door to pick up his mail and maybe grab a cup of coffee. The store is left unlocked without anyone being there. He returns about 9.30 to prepare the materials to go out on the service calls for that day. And his one employee arrives about 10 o'clock. His one employee is a young man, a young man of 65, and for the remainder of the day, these two men, 85 and 65 years old respectively, are out repairing furnaces, fixing plumbing, installing electrical fixtures, and delivering appliances. 
while they are doing their service calls throughout Morris County, the store is still open for business with no employee there. Customers are on an honor system. He trusts people. You can go into the store and pick up what you need, wiring, furnace filters, plumbing parts. You can even buy a used refrigerator or washer or dryer because no one is there to collect the money. The customer either writes up their own detailed billing ticket or they have cash or a check that they leave. I would tell you that people are probably taking items, I would tell him that people are probably taking items out of the store without writing them down or without paying for them and he'll never see the money from them. And his response was, they probably need it more than I do. About four o'clock, the men come back to the shop, the employee goes home, and my dad goes to a convenience store to get coffee with a group of friends. Then it's back to the store about 5 o'clock to see if anything has been sold. He collects the billing tickets and any cash that has been left for that day. He turns out the lights, locks the door, and goes home. It's not unusual for him to get a call later in the evening, often in the middle of eating dinner, from someone who needs him to come out to light their pilot light or to check out their air conditioner. Everybody knows Wally. No matter where he goes in the community, he's recognized and greeted. I've been with him when people have stopped him on the street, giving him a $20 bill and saying, I picked up such and such from the store a couple of weeks ago and didn't make out a ticket. This $20 should cover it. He's active in the church. He gets frustrated when he doesn't think others in the church have the evangelistic zeal that he believes every Christian should have. He visits people in the hospital and nursing homes. In Council Grove, you just mentioned the name Wally and people know who you're talking about. He's one of the most recognized people in the community. He can easily be picked out of a crowd he is no ordinary person. But here are the real facts behind this man who is not ordinary. When my dad was a young man in his early 20s, he met the one who truly was no ordinary man. The one he met who influenced his life to become the person that we know and love. That person was Jesus. My dad recognized that Jesus was no ordinary man. Jesus was the savior of the world, and he became my dad's savior. Here it is. Jesus is radically unlike anyone who has ever lived. In a sea of humanity with so many religious leaders throughout history who have asked the crowds to follow them, those who claim to be the savior of humanity have ended up being just ordinary men, just ordinary women, just ordinary people. Those self-proclaimed religious leaders have been just like everybody else, maybe just louder, maybe just more charismatic, maybe just a Pied Piper. But there is one and only one religious leader in history who could say, who we could say encompassed the true meaning of no ordinary man. That was Jesus Christ. And he was no ordinary man. So for us today, I think here is a good time for us to ask, and I think Wally would want us to ask, do you want to follow the crowd? Or do you want to follow Jesus? The crowd all looks the same, ordinary. But Jesus, he's not ordinary. As Peter added, stated according to John chapter 6, Jesus has the words of eternal life. Jesus is the Holy One of God. We will follow him. I'm grateful that my dad believed and followed Jesus. 
and raised us to be followers of Jesus also. It's my hope that someday people will say about me what I've heard said about my dad. He was no ordinary man. I hope they'll know it because Jesus lives in me. Brother Doug, it's all yours. Dave, can we, uh, can we sing a song, Uncle Dave? Let's do that. You two brothers already got me crying. I'm going to be of no value here in a moment. But I want you to take your song sheets, if you will. Uh, I want to say to uh, Cousin Wayne, who's watching back uh, at home, uh, and uh, to uh, other cousins and others that are, are uh, watching us by Facebook Live and our friend Susan and others, uh, Wish you could be here, wish this mask thing wasn't on, all this was going on. It would be wonderful to be able to gather together with people who would uh, uh, love to be with us as well. But uh, we know you're with us in heart and prayer. And so this morning, Amazing Grace, we're going to sing that. We just Let's sing the first and last verse of Amazing Grace together, if you do that with us. that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found, was blind, but now I see when we've been there, when we've been there. Ten thousand years bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Now, 542, Dave, is when we all get to heaven. And sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. And when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all us will sing and shout the victory verse 4 onward to the prize before us soon his beauty will behold soon the pearly gates they will open we shall tread the streets of gold and when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We will sing and we'll shout the victory. Now I'm going to have you be seated a few more minutes. And I want to wrap this up for us so we can go over for the internment. Janet, I'm going to need what I left there on that. You want to just throw it to me? I'd like to read to you a scripture 
from uh, the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. For we know that if this tent, that as our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we're still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in this body, we're away from the Lord, and we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. My dad and I had opportunities to visit often about a lot of spiritual things. And I enjoyed visits with my dad. And I can tell you the last three years, when, since mom died, dad really struggled with things. Uh, he, we're proud of him. He learned to cook. He learned to do some things he hadn't done before. He just said, he said, you know how heavy that vacuum cleaner is? And we said, yeah, dad, it's pretty heavy. Mom used to run it. I don't know how she did. I don't know how she did. And he would talk about the things he was learning. So he'd call about a crock pot. So he got a real good deal on this crock pot that would feed about 60 people. <laughs> a little bigger than what he needed. And he would do these things. It was fun to watch him just adapt. He said to me as we were in the, as we were dealing with the business and having to close some things down and do those things, you don't know how hard it is for me to change. I said, Dad, I can't even imagine the things you've done all these years. I said, I, and he says, I miss your mom. You know, and he just went down the line with all these things. I said, yeah, I know it's hard. And I'm sorry, Dad. We love you. But we want to take care of you. We want to help you. And his classic word was, I don't need you to take care of me. I just need, I just want to, I want to get back to work. As a matter of fact, it was a month ago, dad was wanting to know if I could break him out of Diversicare <laughs> so that if we could figure out a way for him to do some service calls, do something he would like to do. What am I here for, he asked in August when we announced about being in hospice. And when I took our grandchildren and our children to see him, it was a remarkable moment because I watched my father speak into two 11-year-old grandsons about the woman they would someday marry and saying, you need to get someone like Norma, like I did. And he began to talk about her faith and how what she meant to him. And he began to speak into every one of our grandchildren's lives. And so when, when, when we were all done, Dad, Dad said to me, and, and everybody had left, and I was crying. I mean, I just, I was, I just lost it. We sang Amazing Grace with him. And we, I just lost it. And Dad said, why am I still here? I said, well, you're here because of the COVID. Do I have the virus? I said, no. Well, then why am I here? He just, he couldn't understand, and I couldn't help him understand. But I said, Dad, what you just did today is a ministry. See, my dad was known as Wally Ingmeyer, the Ingmeyer Plumbing Heating Appliance. And I think what happened was he didn't know how to be something else, but all the while in his life, he was something else. I keep hearing from people. Let me tell you some things that I've heard. A businessman came to me a few years ago and said, your dad is a horrible businessman. I said, well, thank you for that kind remark. <laughs> and then he said, I tried to help your dad, but your dad and mom did not want my help. And I said, oh? He said, your dad and mom said, there's more to business than making all that money. There's people, and we want to help people. He says, I couldn't argue with your dad. Dad lost money the last several years. The young couple that came to me one night after we had eaten at the Hayes house and said to me, I want to thank you for your dad. If it wasn't for Wally, my wife and I, we'd just gotten married. we just moved here. We had nothing. And he said, we moved into this place to rent. And he said, we had no refrigerator. We had no stove. And everybody said, well, call Wally. So we called Wally. And your dad gave us a refrigerator and a stove and set it all up and just loved on us that night. He said, we wouldn't have made it had it not been for your dad. 
over and over again, I keep hearing stories. I hear the stories. And the stories are remarkable of what Dad has done. Um, <laughs> I, I remember... Um, I remember your, it says one guy stopped me after I had come to help dad. We were moving dad into the apartment. And one of the guys in town stopped me on this morning. He says, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm helping my dad get some things moved. You're not taking him out of Council Grove, are you? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, we've talked to him about it, but he refuses to go and he wants to stay. Oh, that's good. Your dad is the spiritual leader of our community. He's the pastor shepherd for this town. We need him here. Why? People, even a lady yesterday telling me how much it meant when she would take dad the trays at Diversicare, that dad would always thank her and bless her. And he said, she said, I never felt so loved as I did by your dad, just taking him a tray of food. People have still told us this over and over again. Um, Dad did funerals for the unchurched. Amazing what Pop would do because they trusted him. And, uh, oh. <laughs> we went to Andover for mom's surgery when she was going to have the surgery in her mouth to take care of the cancer. And there was a lady that as we were checking in that began to talk and, and said, are you retired, Mr. Ingmeyer? No, he said, I still have Ingmeyer plumbing, heating, and appliance. And she said, really? She said, I'm a single mom, and I have children. She said, I don't know. She said, I, I need, I've got a problem with my toilet. It's not working right. So her and dad spent the next 10 minutes about her toilet. He said, if you'll do this and this and this, go down to the room and told her what to get. And he says, if you'll do this, you can take care of it. And she says, oh, I hope so, because I can't afford plumber. And we haven't been able to use the toilet for a while. And so dad said, well, try that. Next day, mom comes out, has, has been through the surgery, we've spent the night, and she looks up dad, and she says, thanks, I did it just like you said, and the toilet is working again. And it only cost me whatever it was at Ace Hardware. That was dad. That was dad. It was the whole idea of ministry. This one scripture that I love that says here that I think is, it responds, and this is what dad's already experienced. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive, that is, to be revealed, may be revealed. This is the year of revealing. This revealing of may be revealed what you will receive, what is due you because of what you've done in the body, whether good or evil. I always wondered, what does it mean? How does a Christian who lives in evil do that? But the word evil here, good means to be benevolent, beneficial, giving freely to others, service to others. That's what it means. What is done is good or evil. And the word evil means worthless, having no value for the kingdom of heaven at all. All the things you've done that did not value of bringing people to Christ and knowing people that Jesus loved them and knowing that, that Christ would take care of them, that Christ would be their Savior. And he says, and I thought to myself, Dad, when he left here, I believe every believer goes before the Bema. That's what this is, the Bema judgment. And we receive from Christ. It's revealed to us what we receive by the works we've done in our flesh, whether good or evil. Now, this is as Christians. We're going to heaven. But it's the rewards we receive that we get to spend, that we get to share heaven, the crowns and all the other things that the Bible says we get to have. It's amazing. And I think Dad has already been through that. You see, here's what happened. And I'm leaving the microphone, Wayne, but I'll take it with me. What I want you to understand and know about this, the Bible says that it to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren, look at me, please. I want you to hear me. Because what is here is just a shell. Or, if you will, a glove. A work glove. It's just a glove that held pipe wrenches and did all these things. That did all this stuff for people. It's just a glove. With the hand inside of it, it can do amazing things, can it? With the glove inside, it can shake hands. It can rub backs. It can, it can fix this. It can fix that. It can do all kinds of things. And when dad passed away at 1235 on Monday morning, what happened was that which made dad alive 
went to be with the Lord. The spirit and the soul of my dad. The personality that made my dad who he was and who he will be in heaven. What's awesome, it went to be with Jesus. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And what is here is just an empty glove. Waiting for the day when Jesus comes again and it will be made totally brand new with an eternal body. Now I have to tell you this, it sounds like a sermon, but please hear me. This is my heart because this is what dad and I would talk about. These were the things that mattered. And this is what matters to me. And what matters to my grandsons and my granddaughters. I want you to know this Jesus. And I want you to know that it's going to be okay. And dad asked me one day, so what happens between when I leave here and when I get with Jesus? I said, they're going to come for you. The angels will come, I believe, and they will escort you. You will never be alone. And on the day he died, that, that afternoon, dad was always looking over my shoulder. He wasn't looking at me. He would look past Lori and I. He would, I think there were angels there saying, it's about time. About time, Wally. He couldn't tell us, but he, didn't, he wasn't looking at us and he wasn't weird. He was looking past us. And I want you to know that it's okay. And I said, Dad, you will never be alone. And it's going to be all right. That's what we'd talk about. We had a good dad, good mom. They loved Jesus and they taught us Jesus. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to walk really fast to an 11 o'clock gathering, okay? It's all right. And I'm just going to say this now. At lunch, all you cousins, all you cousins, all you, could you just, could we just kind of introduce everybody again? We haven't seen each other for nigh on to what, 40 years? 20 years, 10 years, a long time. And it's time to introduce ourselves again. You'd be amazed at how Mwali and Norma have affected all of your lives. And we have that in common through Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your blessings. I thank you for my family that you've granted to us. We thank you for mom and dad. We just thank you, Lord, that you have granted us a phenomenal heritage and an Ingmeyer name. Thank you. And Lord, we thank you for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who gives us this hope. So, Father, I pray your blessing on my family right now, this family. And I pray, Lord Jesus, your work. And I pray it will continue in this community that you've started through mom and dad. It will continue some way. I know you will, and I thank you. So I pray your blessing now upon this as in this day, in this family, in this city, in this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. I took your job. Thank you. <clears throat> Would you like to come forward and Would everyone stand, please? Receive the benediction. Go out of here and know that we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us the anchor, the firm hope of the resurrection of Jesus, just as well we have. May the Lord bless all of you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you.